Today's webinar is brought to you by the Rising Tide Mastermind. The Rising Tide Mastermind is a group of individuals that regularly get together, not only to help each other with issues, but to help us all get further faster in all areas of life. Whether the Rising Tide Mastermind is the group for you or another group, now more than ever, everybody needs a group of trusted advisors. The Rising Tide Mastermind is putting on this proactive webinar series so we can focus on the things that we can do and not just worry about the things that we can't. Our presenter today is Mike Hyam of McGowan Insurance Group. Mike is the guy that I go to for anything that has to do with insurance and I consider him a friend and partner. Today we're going to be talking about how we should consider insurance and risk management in this crazy time. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Trace. Pleasure to be here and thank you for having me. Absolutely. I know we've got lots of questions about everything. And, and one of the questions that some people have brought up to me is what should we be doing about insurance, about risk management during this time? And again, I couldn't think of anybody else to ask those questions to but you. So thank you so much for sharing that. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share and uh, go through my slides today. And you're right, this is uh, an unprecedented time and uh, one in which we're all dealing with in, in different ways. I, I hope and pray that uh, this finds everyone and their families and, and colleagues uh, safe and doing well, certainly. Um, as I thought about the uh, presentation today, I wanted to make sure that we uh, highlighted really the areas that from a risk management standpoint that are potentially affecting every business in the country uh, right now, but with particular attention to obviously water treatment uh, industry. So with that, um, just kind of get into this. Um, <clears throat> our introduction here, we're going to talk a little bit about business interruption insurance and business interruption risk. That obviously has been a uh, uh, very highlighted topic here uh, in uh, through the crisis. Um, but there are other considerations from an insurance standpoint to uh, be uh, considered too. Cyber liability, certainly uh, at a, uh, a peak. Unattended property and vacant structures. We're going to talk about this not only from a first party standpoint, but what potential immediate and downstream liabilities may exist as a result of that. Uh, a little bit of an update on workers' compensation because obviously employees are being um, afflicted and affected by uh, this virus and uh, how OSHA uh, has changed their guidance and rulings here recently as a result. Employment practices, always uh, an important area of risk to consider, but especially in this case, the, the relationships, the communications, and how you're working uh, with your employees in largely a remote type of workforce. Um, a little bit about the state of the insurance industry, some uh, comments related to the economics and then capacity or surplus within the industry. Uh, one slide on the health insurance impact. Uh, McGowan rolled out uh, McGowan Benefit Group at the beginning of this year uh, through an acquisition that we had, uh, which we're proud of, and so I wanted to make sure we touched on um, uh, briefly on uh, health insurance impact as a result of the virus. And then finally, just a reminder of some real fundamental uh, controls and risk management practices for specific water treatment industry. So business interruption, um, again, uh, getting a lot of attention uh, in the news and uh, a lot of conversations, lots of questions coming our way um, in this topic. The business interruption insurance really addresses financial loss arising from direct physical loss to the described premises from a covered cause of loss. That's the definition. A couple of key elements though that uh, are within that. Financial loss arising from direct physical loss or damage to the premises, meaning that um, it has to be some direct loss to the described premises, your office, your warehouse, um, your production facility, uh, that kind of a premises is what we're talking about. The other key element here is a covered cause of loss. Uh, more consideration with fire, wind, theft, vandalism, those kinds of, of losses would be those taken under consideration for business interruption insurance. To date, the COVID-19 COVID uh, has not been considered uh, direct physical loss or damage and is not 
currently a covered cause of loss. So uh, the result of that uh, in many cases is that business interruption coverage is not responding uh, to the current crisis that we find ourselves in. And that really goes for much of the business, uh, multi-industry across the country. Um, we are though recommending uh, as an agency that if there is any doubt or there's a desire by our clients to go ahead and file a claim, we gladly want to be able to go ahead and do that. And we have done that in many cases for our clients. Um, it is a step that uh, can be taken. There would probably not be immediate result from that because we're still in the crisis, but it's something that uh, we're glad to do. There is uh, some increased uh, pressure and conversation going on within the uh, state legislatures across the country. Uh, there are about four states right now that are having conversations about setting aside some of the policy language that currently restricts or precludes this coverage. Uh, that uh, has yet to be seen how that's going to play out and develop, but we're paying very close attention to that, obviously. The other key interest, a uh, couple of metrics here and, and some numbers to share, only about 30% of small business across the country currently insures for business interruption. So in the event that the government wanted to retroactively change policy language or do something like that, it is perhaps only going to be focused on about 30% of all small business across the country. The other important consideration here, certainly from the industry's perspective, is the cost of the burden uh, taken on to go ahead and provide that coverage. All P&C property and casualty surplus or capital today in the U.S. is about $812 billion. All companies uh, lumped together. If the industry were to go ahead and take on payment for this risk, you're looking at in the neighborhood of 250 billion on a monthly basis. So you can see very quickly, it would erode the capital and surplus of the entire insurance industry. Um, so therefore, um, the industry really is at this point, not financially able to handle such a catastrophic uh, crisis and, and loss uh, globally. And really the federal government is, is about the only entity and therefore we've seen some of the programs rolled out in various phases from the federal government to help support uh, business to maintain their employees, to pay their rent and do other things like that. Uh, certain effort, efforts are uh, being talked about though uh, in the future to figure out a way in which uh, the insurance industry may become a catalyst or a methodology for providing some kind of additional relief here. So again, time will tell how that all plays out. Um, and you know, there's other things that the insurance industry has been doing. Uh, there's grace periods, uh, moratoriums on cancellations and other things to really soften the pressure on business owners today so that they can continue to pay their people and sustain operations uh, overall. If you do, um, one recommendation here, whether you do submit a claim now or choose not to do that, careful and complete documentation is what we would uh, suggest you have. And meaning that um, not with the uncertainty coming down the road and not knowing where this is really gonna play out, uh, maintain good, accurate records from an accounting standpoint. Um, any loss of business uh, as a result of this, uh, extra expenses, that extraordinary expenses that a business owner might incur. Mike, we had another speaker come on and they recommended that we keep all of those uh, charges in a special COVID-19 account. Would that be also a good idea to do if we ever file something for insurance that we can go back and say, these are all of the extra expenses we've had due to this? Yeah, I think uh, that would be a great recommendation. Isolating this event and the impact of this event on a particular business is really what we're trying to achieve here. So uh, separate banking uh, account, um, a dedicated repository for all of this information, something that a business owner can very quickly and easily uh, get access to and provide 
to whomever may be asking for it down the road? Good question. Moving on, and obviously there are other areas of insurance and risk that are being affected uh, by the crisis, but cyber liability, of course, is, is at the top of that list too. And uh, really as a result of our nation converting into a very remote workforce um, overnight, quite honestly, um, has unfortunately brought on additional threats from a uh, cyber and privacy uh, risk standpoint. Um, I know from McGowan's standpoint, we've had to completely convert to a remote workforce, which we now have done very successfully, but it didn't happen overnight. It took uh, a little bit of time. We had to uh, acquire some additional equipment. We had to get some people that have, were not familiar with working remotely up and running. Um, so a little bit of time and energy obviously went into all of that, um, probably in, in similar ways for every business across the country. Um, the other uh, impact here that we're seeing is that Americans have uh, really a need for instant information, right? So there's a lot coming at us every day. We can't get away from the news. A lot of uh, social connections we're trying to broaden and, and while we're isolated, trying to virtually connect uh, with people in our uh, various communities, business and otherwise. So all of that supports some of these additional threats that are uh, taking place. And we've seen an increase in cyber activity uh, and claim activity as a result of that. Specifically, I have a few mentioned uh, below, uh, fake domain registries uh, related to accessing ventilators, accessing masks, healthcare information, things like that. Um, increased certainly of phishing attacks, uh, really kind of playing on the fear of the American population and the urgency again to uh, acquire information and acquire these supplies. Of course, we've got the uh, nation states uh, that um, continue uh, and really have increased their uh, infiltration from a cyber standpoint, that's not going away. And then employer issues, much like what I just mentioned, um, you know, more pressure on your IT staff, uh, uh, setting up perhaps and uh, securing VPN connections, um, uh, unprotected home networks that are now relied upon by those employees who really, again, had no, um, no ability to work remotely before all of a sudden are at that point. A uh, few tips here, though, that we can uh, point to. And um, overall, um, a continued uh, diligent effort by every user and really when it comes to cyber it does boil down to every user of a computer or a, a handheld device or whatever it might be to make the right decisions so it's very much a, a human behavior uh, element here but specifically uh, we want to make sure that we're validating um, all of the fields validating who we're receiving emails from uh, there's double extended scams going on right now. So where you see the example of the safe.txt.exe, uh, we want to stay away from those. Any executable type of attachments that we may receive in an email, certainly pass on those. And uh, the email that we keep getting from uh, the sales guy, let's say, or somebody like that, we really got, want to get rid of that, the unsubscribe button, while it would seem that that would be a good way to go, uh, can in certain cases invite uh, security risk. So far better just to delete that email. I never considered that, Mike. That's great advice. I can't tell you how many things I've unsubscribed to because I just hate getting the emails and I've opened sure. a portal up possibly. Yeah. And um, not all, in all cases, certainly, but in this environment, I think it's something to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then never obviously click those embedded links uh, with uh, URL, URLs that don't look familiar and so forth. So the, the, really at the end of the day, I take the, the position that uh, if in doubt, delete that email. And if it turns out that you made a mistake, it was really a legitimate email, somehow, some way that connection is gonna come around again and they'll reach back out. So rather be uh, safe than sorry. 
Uh, switching gears here just a little bit, uh, unattended property, vacant structures, um, we see an increase of uh, this uh, circumstance or this situation really as a result of everyone, again, working remotely. So um, obviously vacant structures become targets for increase in crime. So theft and vandalism uh, certainly is on the rise and the increase. Um, unattended properties though have the ability, depending upon weather conditions and uh, location and so forth for water damage events and and that kind of thing that could go left unattended or unaddressed because of no one being around. Uh, from a liability perspective though, especially for water treatment companies, this is something to be aware of because depending upon how this has impacted the service level and frequency um, by the water treatment um, company, that could be um, a catalyst for increased claim activity. So these systems that have been um, shut down perhaps or lowered uh, frequency of service calls uh, and attendance, I think now and into the future certainly uh, we'll want to pay very special attention to that. So that's that downstream risk from the unattended uh, properties. Workers' compensation. Uh, this area too is being uh, affected uh, through the uh, the situation that we find ourselves in. It's important to know though, uh, there are really two main tests when it comes to the compensability decisions of a workers' compensation claim. Now, this does vary from state to state because workers' compensation is regulated at a state level, but generally speaking, did the incident, did the claim, did the injury arise out of and in the course of scope of employment? number one, and did the injury arise out of or be caused by conditions peculiar, the word peculiar is important, to the work. So the scope test really would be um, a test of benefit. Did the employer benefit from the employee's work and the engagement of that employee that uh, resulted in the injury? So let's say yes to that. The other test then, peculiar, are the conditions that are in the, uh, the employee is exposed to in their environment, are they unique in a way that it would lead to an increased exposure to the virus, okay? So obvious example is perhaps our healthcare system because obviously they're in an environment that one would think could lead to an increased exposure, obviously, to, uh, to the crisis. Um, also, obviously, as an example, black lung disease related to the coal miners uh, back in the day, that was a peculiar um, increased exposure. So really both of those things have to exist in order for a claim to be compensable, um, generally speaking, and with regard to this virus. Again, compensability decisions do vary quite a bit based on state law and the interpretation, obviously, of the carrier that's uh, um, working the claim. Now OSHA has um, changed some of their policies and some of their guidance here as well. And they've indicated that should an employer, if you're subject to reporting uh, via OSHA, first of all, that it, should you have a case uh, with an employee of COVID-19, that is mandated to be reported on your OSHA log for the time being. Uh, that may change down the road, but for right now, that's the uh, that is the requirement. Certainly if there is a um, serious injury or death as a result of that, that requires a direct notification to OSHA within 24 hours. Um, I also wanted to highlight here uh, the specific website from OSHA because um, it may be worth some time to go out and, and take a look around there. There's an awful lot of great information that OSHA has come out with specifically related to the crisis and uh, everything from templates to prevention and control, uh, hazard identification, et cetera. So uh, whether you're subject to reporting uh, via OSHA or not, uh, this is available to every employer and probably is uh, worthwhile spending some time. Um, we see, um, you know, this being a 
risk that is obviously not going to go away. And as employers begin to embrace bringing back um, a skeleton crew or all of their employees into the workforce and, and getting back to some level of normalcy, um, they're also going to have some responsibilities to making sure that that's done in a very effective way and they're not um, exposing uh, any group of people uh, unnecessarily to risk and hazard. So again, this website can uh, provide an awful lot of good information, but we encourage everyone to begin to kind of think about developing some kind of a response plan or disease management plan for the workplace. I think we'll see some additional um, litigation out of this too. And in fact, Walmart currently has a case uh, against them by the family of an employee who died. Just a few other things uh, we wanted to talk about um, with regard to uh, liability risk. This is employment practice liability. And as a reminder, employment practice liability uh, insurance really addresses the relationship between the employer and the employee. Traditional allegations of wrongful termination, harassment, discrimination, so forth, that type of thing. But we can see um, risk coming about immediately and down the road um, with relation to uh, employment uh, practices. Uh, specifically, how are employers continuing to support and really communicate, encourage, um, and work with their remote employees? Do employees feel a little bit left out in the cold to fend for themselves? Are they, are they getting the kind of training and the ongoing support that's necessary for all employees? So being attentive to that is important. Also the wage and hour issue. Um, um, I know uh, in many cases, because of the um, ability to work at home, you may have situations where people are really putting in a lot more time uh, in their work than what they might have traditionally been doing in the office. So uh, there could be some level of expectation down the road to be compensated for that additional time and effort. Um, downstream issues uh, that we can see uh, may be uh, as a result of layoffs or furloughs, uh, reduction in hours, and then uh, how that is rolled out and to what groups of employees has that been rolled out. So is it done in a very systematic way with good documentation and track record um, or more shoot from the hip? So being attentive to that too. But again, we believe that there could be some uh, litigation coming down the road. Now, within the uh, employment practice policies, there are two key uh, exclusions. There are more exclusions, but these are the key ones. I just mentioned the wage and hour um, matter. That is not widely covered uh, right now by employment practice uh, policies. There is some uh, expense reimbursement for a wage and hour claim, but likely no damage payment there. The other key element or key exclusion would be bodily injury, bodily injury to your employee, okay, uh, because they become uh, ill with the, uh, with the disease. That, again, would revert back to what we just talked about with workers' compensation. So it's excluded under the EPL policy because it's picked up under the uh, workers' compensation policy. Now, another uh, important uh, feature that really goes overlooked for those companies that do have an employment practice policy, and we recommend that all the time, whether it's in normal times or in these uh, times of crisis, um, but the policies, uh, almost all of them provide a free employment legal advice hotline. So a confidential resource that the employer, the manager can pick up the phone, have a conversation with an employment attorney and walk through whatever kind of a situation may be taking place, or just provide some advice for how to handle a particular uh, situation. So that's a free resource. And again, um, I would encourage um, everyone to make, be making use of that. I'd mentioned that uh, just a brief uh, uh, 
highlight on the uh, health uh, industry, health insurance, switching gears just a little bit. Um, it will no doubt be affected by this. Um, you know, the carriers uh, in, in many ways are really stepping up, the insurance carriers, Anthem, United, and others, uh, to provide uh, for 100% uh, uh, cost reimbursement for the testing that's going on. They're making other accommodations where uh, applicable as well. But the, uh, the impact financially on that industry um, varies widely, as you can see, but anywhere on the low side from about 34 billion up to 230 billion. So those are big numbers. And, um, you know, again, time will tell how that plays out, but we would expect that we see um, some kinds of underwriting changes and development and then certainly uh, some upward pressure on uh, premium increases. Uh, from an economic standpoint, and really uh, kind of the state of this industry, the property and casualty insurance industry, um, all of the carriers are really paying very close attention to their own solvency. Um, they have some unknowns out there like the business interruption, that's BI. Uh, and what the outcome of that may be um, to their surplus, uh, but they but they also know that they need to have the money to pay uh, the normal claims, the traditional claims, and the the auto accidents, the fires, and and the wind damage and things like that that do come about. Um, so preservation of that capacity and making sure it's deployed um, in a smart way by the industry is top of mind. Uh, we've seen some uh, very small pockets of liability where carriers have called for a moratorium on any new business, again, to preserve that capacity for their current uh, book of uh, renewal customers. Um, that's not widespread, but again, very, uh, very isolated within management liability. So directors and officers, fiduciary, some employment practice lines, that type of thing. Um, other carriers are just kind of tightening up their uh, normal terms. So timeframes on pending quotes have been tightened, uh, a reluctance to extend policies for a period of time, and other, you know, some restrictive uh, actions really in the commercial uh, insurance uh, framework. And then um, this was really happening even before the crisis, but we have seen a great deal of momentum on what I call underwriting scrutiny. So prior to the crisis, everybody was making money in the market. Right now, not so much. And so that's putting pressure on the underwriting side uh, for the industry. And that underwriting scrutiny um, is on the increase. And I think we'll continue to see that certainly through uh, the end of this year with again, the uncertainty of knowing whether this crisis is gonna come around again or not. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, some overall, some general firming um, in the pricing and some of the coverages that are being provided, um, but a real focus and key on risk qualification, right? The characteristics uh, that make up uh, the underwriting considerations that are taken into account uh, along with making sure that uh, pricing and premium development meets with that level of risk. So more and more, uh, we're talking with our clients that now is the time to really have a renewed focus on your internal risk management, your internal risk controls. Um, if an insurance carrier has given uh, recommendations in the past and that's not been necessarily at the top of your priority list, it may not make it to the top of your priority list right now, but I would recommend paying a little bit closer attention to some of those recommendations. <clears throat> Anything that can be done, policies, procedures, physical controls. Um, we've talked an awful lot about automobile risk in the past and what controls can be placed uh, uh, for driving uh, behavior and uh, controlling your employees. All of those things become more and more important as we build um, uh, the characteristics, the positive characteristics of our own business. Um, so what better time than be reaching out to your insurance professional, whomever that may be, 
because they have the resources and should have the resources to help get you to that point. Specifically for water treatment, um, it, really this is a, a, a page about really kind of going back to the fundamentals in my mind, but it's, uh, it's important to um, go back over uh, at times like this. Um, we see um, um, a continued effort to really document and communicate with customers here. And we've talked a lot about that in the past with uh, various clients and various webinars, but now more than ever, <clears throat> documentation and communication is key because um, it, it's just more difficult. You're not there all the time with your customer face-to-face. -face. You're not maybe sharing those back and forth emails quite as often. Um, so a concerted effort by the water treatment professional to be well documented and really just to kind of pick up the phone um, and talk with your customer. It may be a great opportunity, both professionally and personally, to make a reconnection here where, um, where one needs to be made or just kind of catch up and make sure that their needs are being met. I would also recommend internally now is the time to be working as a team, uh, strategize, game plan, uh, any trends or conversations that some of your employees may be hearing um, from their customers, share that information. So anything you can do internally to really um, pass off information and work as a team on this um, is recommended. Um, again, we talked about <clears throat> policies and procedures and just increasing uh, the positive characteristics of your business. And so there may be some extra time uh, on your hands right now. So updating those policies and procedures would be uh, something we'd recommend. Um, you know, Adam Green, I'll, I'll highlight him. He had a nice article here in late March that really talked about a lot of these fundamental things too. So not only from just a good quality risk management standpoint, but really building your position in the unlikely event that um, that doc documentation or other information is called into question because of a lawsuit or a claim, uh, it all goes hand in hand, really. Um, so evaluate your risk ongoing, have the conversations with your trusted advisors, listen to scale up because uh, they've got the the right information to share, obviously, and Tracy do a great job with that. Well, I and appreciate that plug, thanks. Problem. And um, relate with your business communities. There are partnerships out there, and uh, what we hear all the time is that we'll get through this together, and I really do believe that. Uh, I think we will get through this together as long as we rely on each other and help each other. So with that, uh, it's been a pleasure, uh, Trace, and uh, but I felt uh, a need to kind of go through some of these items and I would uh, welcome any questions. Yeah, Mike, uh, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned a lot of coverages. Um, <clears throat> a lot of listeners might have all those coverages, but maybe they don't have cyber liability and they've spent some time training their people how to work from home. Now they've got that infrastructure in place and now they're on the back end with cyber liability. How should they go about that? Well, I, I think um, having a good foundation there and, and working with their people is, is critical. Um, the insurance uh, available uh, in the cyber market is still very available. There's not been uh, a retraction there that we have seen uh, uh, at all. Um, and similar to what I mentioned about that free legal advice with uh, the employment practice policy, the cyber policies, the leading cyber policies today have kind of the same uh, risk management hotline available. So an awful lot of the work and oversight and the policy and the training uh, development that employers are doing to mitigate their own cyber risk can be supplemented and is sometimes uh, taken care of by the services that come with the cyber policies. So there's really two main benefits there. Number one, you've got a good back room for the policies and the training. But number two, if for whatever reason all that fails, you've got a good insurance product to go ahead and take care of the incident. 
Mike, what if someone out there is having an issue with accounts receivable because of COVID-19? People are just hanging on to their money longer. And now they've got to make a choice. Do I pay my employees or do, my, do I pay my insurance premiums? What advice do you have for them? Um, I think we want to hear, I, I know as an insurance provider, uh, I would expect that I could speak for all insurance providers. I think that we want to hear from those clients. We want to hear that message. We want to hear specifically what they're going through and what they're dealing with. And we'll go to great extent and great efforts to accommodate uh, to the best of our ability any kind of a cash crunch that they may be experiencing. Now, we're the agent, we're not the carrier. So we'll work hand in hand with whomever the insurance carrier might be. But from what we have seen, there is considerable accommodation and flexibility being provided by the insurance industry today on that. Mike, with those people that have renewals coming up, is now the time to shop other carriers or should they, should they just stay where they are? Well, I think that there's always a case for loyalty. There's always a case for understanding the value, not only in terms of price, but the, the breadth of coverage, uh, the particular language within the policies and so forth. So a lot comes into play there. Um, we keep very close attention uh, to that. I think that the insurance industry, as we speak right now, so long as we don't have uh, extenuating loss issues or some other uh, negative feature going on with a particular client, I think the insurance industry, especially for their renewal book, uh, is wanting to maintain a very even keel uh, posture in terms of pricing, uh, any kind of changes in terms and conditions and so forth. So um, I would broadly say, keeping with what you know, keeping with who you know, um, unless there are extenuating circumstances, I think right now is probably a place to stay pat. Well, Mike, we're going to answer some more questions. We're going to uh, reconvene in the Rising Tide Mastermind uh, Zoom room. And uh, I know those guys have some questions for you, but I want to thank you for, for doing this webinar. I know you shared a lot of information that have helped some people probably got a lot of people thinking about some things that they should be doing right now great glad to do it trace thank you